Give me Jesus. Straight mind. I mean, totally straight mind. Out of my body. Dead for an hour and a half. My name is Richard Cole, and I am 72 years old. I have never been real, what I would call, religious. I've always believed that there was a God, and I believed that there was Jesus, but I've had doubts. I've been a doubter uh, before, but I'm no longer that. And this happened to me uh, in 2005, so that was six years ago. And so, um, how it came about was that um, I um, was on my way to Monterey. I go up there every year for the historic car races. While I stopped at the stoplight, I had a pain that started in my jaw, right in the mandibular area. Went down my jawbone, down my carotid artery, and into my chest. And I said, oh, this is strange. My friend and his wife said, what's wrong with you? You don't look very good. What's your symptoms? I said, well, my hands feel a little sweaty and I feel a little clammy. I said, I don't know what's going on. He says, I'm going to take you to the hospital. I said, oh, I'll be okay. I'll go home and take an aspirin. This will be done with. He says, no, we're going right now. So we went in and they put me on a gurney because there was no room in the emergency room. My blood pressure was extremely high. And uh, they gave me a couple of shots right away to try and get my blood pressure down. And then I went right into the uh, x-ray room and uh, they gave me some x-rays and uh, came back in a little while and Steve, the doctor, a friend of mine, says, you have a serious problem. And I said, oh, really? And he says, yes. He says, uh, you have an aneurysm, but what's worse, it's split and I think you're bleeding internally. Five o'clock the next morning, I was in the pre-op, the, the ready room, rather, at uh, Cottage Hospital. An anesthesiologist came in and says, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, give you, a, give you a shot right now, and then uh, you're going to go off to sleep. I said, okay. I said, is the doctor here yet? Yeah, he's here. So I asked to see him. I said, okay, what are you guys going to do to me? And he says, well, he says, um, what we have to do is cool you down to a real low temperature, and when we do that, it'll be just like chopping a hole in Lake Michigan in the ice in the middle of the winter. Everything's going to stop. Your brain's going to stop, and your heart will stop. I said, well, I've never heard of that before, uh, and I read a lot. And he says, well, he says, we usually don't tell our patients what we're going to do to them, or else they'd run down the hall dragging the IV behind them. They told me when I went in that I'd have about a 50-50 chance of making it. I found out later with that kind of operation where they take your heart out, you have a 10% chance of survivability. So the anesthesiologist put the IV in. I went off to sleep right away. And they start rolling me down the hall to the operating room. And then I realized that I was still conscious and I wasn't under yet. It was like I was for a little bit, but then I was awake again. And I saw him row me into the operating room. And so I wanted to tell the doctors that, hey, you got to give me some more of whatever it was you gave me because I'm not out yet. But I couldn't speak. I didn't have any pain or anything like that. I just could not open my mouth and get the words out, even though I tried very hard to tell him that I was still conscious. So I'm laying on the table, and um, there are three doctors standing over me and two nurses, and they all have their gowns on, their mask on and everything, they're ready to go. And I heard the doctor ask the nurse for the scalpel, and she got it, and she started to open me up from right here down to here, he did opened me up like that, and then they got in a, an electric saw out and started cutting my breastbone open. And then um, I saw them go down and start to take my heart out, and then everything went black. But I was still conscious. 
but I couldn't see anything. And it was like um, a heavy black fog, and I'm just standing there looking around. I, I couldn't figure out what to do next or what was going to happen next. Right then, two beams of light came over my right shoulder. So I started to turn around and look over my shoulder to see where it was coming from. And then I heard a voice. And the voice was very authoritative, um, not loud, but he says, don't turn around. And I'm thinking, well, why not? And he says, don't turn around because if you see my face, you'll have to stay here. And he says, now, that, that'll be okay if you stay here, but I have a job for you. And if you disobey me, I won't be happy. And he says, you don't want to see me unhappy. So I said, yeah, well, okay. I better pay attention and do what he says. And then I said, you know, I know who you are. He said, oh, you do? And I said, yeah. And all during this conversation, I had a feeling of where he was, that he was walking back and forth behind me, uh, that he was sitting in a white throne, a, just a plain chair, it didn't have jewels or anything on it, but just a plain white chair. And um, I could just feel that, and I don't know why. I, I just, that's what I was feeling. The next thing that happened is, uh, he said, well, he says, uh, do you have any more questions before you leave? I said, I, I, I said, you know, uh, I got to think about this. And I thought and I thought, I was thinking really hard, what am I going to ask God? Couldn't think of anything. <laughs> I wanted to be really smart enough to ask him something very pertinent. And so I said, well, I'm going to have to revert to an old cliche. What's the meaning of life? And he starts laughing again. I said, what's, what's so funny now? And he says, well, I don't know why, but a lot of people ask me that question. And it's really real simple. But I tell you what, when you come back, we'll sit down. You can ask me all the questions that you ever will have. I'll answer them for you. So I said, OK. He says, okay, it's time for you to go back. And I turned around. I'm sorry, but he put his arms around me. He put his arms around me. And it was a feeling that I can't explain. It was unconditional love, but it was words. I can't tell you the words. And I'm sorry, but I always act like this because I can feel it again. So, uh, uh, it, it uh, changed, changed my life. And, uh, The next thing I heard was the nurse was saying, I think he's ready to come out of it. His temperature's at 90 degrees. Nine days later, I was discharged from the hospital. First thing I wanted to do was go out and tell everybody I knew what happened to me. Uh, but I'll have to tell you that my life has changed completely. I'm no longer afraid of death. All the problems that I thought were problems are all gone. I don't have any problems. I don't have anything that gets me down. A week later, a guy came in that I knew, and he said, I heard about your experience. I said, yeah, I, yeah, it happened. You know, He said, I heard that you were, you know, you had a near-death experience and that you were out for about an hour. And I said, yeah, that's true. And he said, well, the same thing happened to me. I said, and then I asked him what the meaning of life was, and he says, oh, that's easy, it's all about love. But that was the perfect answer, so I got that message right away. Now, I study the Bible, and it's taken me a long time. I've been doing it for six years, and up to Matthew, I've translated 
every word from the original manuscripts into English. I was baptized recently. People ask me questions about that. Well, why are you getting baptized now? And I said, because it's the right time. You know, I don't know what else to tell them. I, I don't believe that you have to be baptized to go to heaven, but I know one thing. I want to follow what Jesus did. He set an example. I want to. So I did.